Hebrews chapter 10, we will be looking at verses 19 through 25, a familiar passage of scriptures that we've all probably read, particularly uh, verse 25, but we'll get that into that in a moment here. So this morning I want to talk about hope. Hope. How many need hope for 2015? Some of you don't. Most of us do. <laughs> Most of us do. I'm, I'm with you on that one. I need a lot of hope this year. In fact, I feel like this guy here who George Herbert uh, wrote a quote, hope is the poor man's bread. Hope is a poor man's bread, right? When you don't have anything anymore, you're, you've exhausted everything, there's one thing you can have, and that's hope. That's hope. Uh, a, a joke of a poor man who was hoping to gain, he said, Lord, is it true that to you a million years is like a second? And the Lord answered, yes. The guy says, wow. Is it also true that to you a million dollars is like a penny? And the Lord said, yes. And the guy said, wow. So you think I can have a penny? <laughs> and the Lord said, in a second. <laughs> Sometimes all you have is, is hope. That's a lot to have when you have nothing. Especially when we hope in God. Because hoping in God, we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. And nothing is impossible with God. And as Christians, we know that biblical hope rests on the trustworthiness of God to keep His promises to us. Nothing else. You see, hope is objective and not subjective. Let me define those words for you. I remember when I first saw those words, I like, what does that mean? objective and subjective you have to remember i came from a poor background i wasn't an educated person so all this stuff was new to me i had to look up in the dictionary what does that mean you know and, and have pictures drawn like the you know not the cavemen are real but little pictures so i can kind of okay that's what it means objective means is that you see the objective truth in something uh, what is really there what is the text really saying when it comes to the bible uh, don't add to it which is subjective uh, don't draw conclusions from it, which is subjective, but just take what is there and what is being said. For instance, hope. It is objective, and we need to view it objectively through the lens of the scriptures and what God says hope is. If we view it subjectively, then we can come up with all kinds of weird conclusions unto hope. And see, we need to understand that because a lot of us have the idea incorrectly that, that hope is something we wish for. And it's not. It's not something that we wish for. It's something that we can depend upon. The biblical view of hope is thus significantly different from that found in ancient Greek philosophy or even in our culture today. The Greeks recognized that human beings express hope by nature. There's just something in us that, that, that just you know, cries out for help from time to time because of our situations in life. And so we cry out to hope. I, I hope this works out. I hope things get better. Uh, I hope things change. I hope that person will leave. I hope that person will be a part of my life. You know, we, we hope for things. It's just natural. However, the kind of hope reflected um, re reflects good and also bad. We don't always get what we hope for. And, and that can be bad for some people. We can get a negative attitude. We can get depressed. We, we can get upset at things because it didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to turn out. And that's a subjective hope, basically. The world's hope views hope as a, a hope that has no real reference point. Uh, there's no foundation to it. It's just hope in hope. You know, in, in a sense, uh, it could be positive thinking. Uh, I saw a post by a relative of mine the other day. Her mother uh, had uh, a hernia and she needed to have surgery done. And so she put out the word, could you send prayers to my mom? Could you send vibes to my mom? And I'm just reading that. Okay, so how do I send prayers to her? You know, how do I send vibes? You know, ooh, ooh. You know, it just didn't make any sense to me because I know what hope is and I know what prayers are. 
And so I was a little bit upset, uh, especially knowing the background of my family member, Virginia's family members and so forth. So I put on there, I am definitely praying to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who will answer prayers, who will guide the hands of doctors so that your mom gets well through this whole situation. Yeah. Now that, that's accurate. That's objective. Not this subjective idea of vibes, ooh, you know, or positive thinking. If I just think positive, then things will happen. Now, I agree to a certain degree, if you're a positive person, that sometimes things just come your way. Yeah. Uh, I, I know a friend that uh, was very positive thinking, grew up in the positive church movement, and so everything to him was positive. Uh, he would just go down the street, and he would find a bike lane by the road, and said, praise God, he blessed me with a bike. And he'd take the bike and ride to church. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, that was someone's bike. No, it's my bike. The Lord laid it right there. He knew I was going to church and I needed a ride and so he gave it to me. <laughs> That's positive. <laughs> but not a good positive. It's not an objective positive. That's a subjective positive in his eyes. So hope is, is a projection of one's own subjective possibilities. And we need to be really careful with that. Biblical hope avoids the subjectivity by being founded on something that provides a sufficient basis for confidence in its fulfillment, like God and his redemptive acts as they cultivate through his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. Those are facts. Those are evidence that we can depend on and know and believe in. And those things give us hope. The hope that Jesus was born. The hope that Jesus did walk this earth. And so we have a man who walked this earth who understands us. And so we can go to him as a high priest and we can make our requests be known to him. And since he resurrected from the dead and has control over death itself, then we can depend on him that he will answer us. There's no disappointment in that kind of hope, is there? Because we know he's a loving, caring God. See, God isn't this being that's way out there. And we have to scream and yell to get his attention. No, he is a personal being who becomes a father to us. And we become his children. And we can just whisper and he hears us in our prayers. And like a good father, well, let me rephrase that because some fathers are not good. <laughs> but like a father should be, he gives us what he knows is best for us. He knows what the future holds. He knows what we'll do. And so he gives us exactly what he thinks we need. And knowing that, I can be okay with it because then I know that he has you know, my interest in mind. He'll take care of me even though I don't get what I want. You know, I, I don't have it my way. God still has my back. And so it's never disappointing. What you and I need today is more objective hope, don't we? We need to understand what we really are hoping for, for, especially for the year 2015. And this year is going to bring on new challenges. And I'm hoping blessings beyond measure. Blessings that you will see take place in your life that you can only contribute to God being a part of it. Not, not to chance, not to well-wishing, but that God made that happen. This year has been a tremendous, or last year has been a tremendous year for us. God did such a wonderful work. He broke all records and we're just blown away by it because it was nothing that we did. It was only his grace and his mercies. And I'm hoping for a better year, 2015, not just for the church, but for all of us because you're his children. Let's go ahead and read the text this morning so we get the context. Verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love 
and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now we'll focus on verse 23 this morning. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verses 22 through 25 logically depend on verses 19 through 21. And so within the context, and let me summarize, the point is that we have a way to God through our Lord and Savior and High Priest, Jesus Christ. We have access to Him where we find help in time of need. And so as verses 23 to 24 say, we can come near to Him. We can hold on and we can have concerns. And so this year, I hope that this year will be a year of blessings and grace and mercies for you. My theme is hope for a new year. Hope for a new year. Isaiah 43, 19 says, Behold, I will do a new thing. I love that scripture. It's beautiful because you see the heart of God wanting to do a new thing in our lives. Something different. He wants to get rid of the old and give you something new. He says, Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? It shall even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. When you look at the context of Isaiah there, God is speaking to his people, even though they have been sinning, even though they are in idolatry and are backsliding to a certain degree. What he is saying in context here is, look, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm not going to think about your failures. I'm not going to think about the past. I'm going to think about the future. And I want you to know I'm going to do something new in your life. We have to live that way, understanding that God looks to the future and not to the past. We have to forget 2014. Yeah, learn from our mistakes, grow and mature, but don't hang on to them. Don't let them become a weight. You're anchored to the bottom of the floor and you're not moving anywhere. Learn from those mistakes and go forward to something new that God has for you. Because that's God's heart here, is that he has something new for you. That's his way. He's not keeping record of your wrongs. He's not keeping track of the things you did or you did not do. What he's doing is preparing something new for you in the future for 2015. Let's go back to verse 23. Let us hold fast. Paul says here. Now, I love that word, hold fast. In the Greek, it suggests that we need to keep on holding. Uh, I have a little note here in my Bible that I just saw, but um, I can't remember who who quoted it, but it it really describes this word. It's like a dog who bites on a rope and won't let go. (laughs) Right? Hold fast. You know, you you bit on that rope and you just don't let go of it. We have a St. Bernard, we've got a poodle, let's see, we've got pigs, we've got we got the St. Bernard, and he loves ropes. And and if you have a rope in your hand, he will bite it, and he will not let go. And you're like, you're being dragged by him, because he's a St. Bernard. And so he won't let go. He's stubborn that way. Well, we need to be stubborn that way. We're to not let go of our confession, of our hope, without wavering. So whatever it is that you're hoping for, uh, let me... Let me be a little subjective here because it doesn't give us um, things to hope for here. Now we can read scriptures and find a lot of things to hope for, but there are some things that we have to hope for because we have needs. We have to live in this world. Uh, We have to provide for our family, so we need to hope for good jobs, for good pay raises. We need to hope for good transportation. We need to hope for good relationships. Those are all things that are good. You know, hoping for a new car maybe which is okay to a certain degree. I mean, it can be a negative thing too if you're going from a Cadillac to, you know, uh, Maserati or something. You know, then I would say that's a little extreme there. But, but if you're hoping for a new car so that God can be glorified through it and maybe you'll start picking up people and bringing them to church, hey, that's a good thing. It's a good hope. And I think God will honor that and bless you with it. And so whatever your confession of that hope is, Hold on to it if it's a good thing. And you know that it's not a selfish thing. And it's not just for yourself, but it's also going to glorify God. Don't waver. 
And that word means unwavering. It is a confession of hope and not of despair. Not of despair. It's easy to get discouraged, but true hope looks at the one who holds hope in his hands, and that's Jesus Christ. And when you're looking at him, then you don't get despaired. When you look at yourself and the world around you, yeah, you can become despaired. For he, highlight that, he who promised is what? Faithful. Boy, that's when we should memorize. God is faithful. May be rendered because we know that God always does what he has promised to do or will do what he has promised to do. God is faithful to do it. If he said it, it will come to pass. You can depend on it. And what's interesting is this verse here within its context is speaking of Christians living in the present. Paul wrote this to the Christian believer at that time for their lives, what they were going through at the time, these Jews. And he's also writing to us today in our present time. So this scripture is for you to have hope and to hang on to that hope. Don't waver from it. Believe God and he's faithful to give it to you. So I hope that um, 2015 will be a blessed hope. Hope. I'm not going to exhaust the word. There's a lot of usages in the scriptures like eternal life. We hope in our eternal life, in our eternal security, um, various other issues. So I'm just going to give you some words uh, pertaining to hope in our lives, especially for the up and coming year. But you can do a study on just the word hope and just exhaust it completely, which is a good thing for you to do to understand it even more. But hopefully um, you'll get the idea. Uh, I've taken the word hope and I've created an acronym. There's another word that I never knew. What is an acronym? You know. So you take a word and, and you break it up in its letter form and you create a phrase that relates to that word, which is very difficult to do. So I didn't do this, <laughs> but it made sense. Hope, hang on to his promises. So you might want to write this down. Hang on to his promises. O, for H-O, O, overcome adversities. Overcome adversities in 2015. For P, pursue truth. Pursue truth. And then for E, endure trials patiently. So hang on to his promises, Overcome adversities, pursue truth, endure trials patiently. So let's look at the first one. Hang on to his promises. And that really is right in line with verse 23. Let us hold on firmly to the hope. Or, or let us continue to hope firmly or strongly in our hopes. In a negative sense, let us not cease to hope for a moment. You can hang on to God's promises. In fact, you must hang on to God's promises. You have to hang on to his promises. There are no other promises that you can hang on without God. You need God a part of that promise. The emphasis here in that scripture is placed upon what is hoped for. What is hoped for. What are you hoping for for 2015? One may even translate, let us have complete confidence in what we hope for. So what are you hoping for, for 2015? I hope good things. I hope better relationships with your spouse. I, I think that's a good thing to hope for. <clears throat> that means some change on your part, and yes, on their part also. <coughs> hoping for good relationships with your children, maybe for your job maybe for some relationships that have been broken. Whatever that hope is, we need to hang on to that hope in Christ Jesus. What's also interesting, probably more than, than what is hoped for, is that <clears throat> the focus is on God and not on the believer. You know, we're hoping for something, but the focus is not on us. It's on God who gives us that hope. Because God is the one who promised to give us that hope. And if we rely on him, he will give it to us. Job, for example, was a man that went through a lot. I, mean, I would never wish that on anyone 
to go through what he went through. To lose all your children? That's tough. All of them, gone. And then, to become so sick that you had boils, not just on the outside, but on the insides? And be in pain and suffering? And to have a very encouraging wife who said, curse God and die? <laughs> That's kind of encouraging, I guess, if you die. <laughs> I mean, you can lose hope in that type of situation. You can kind of wonder, okay, what am I doing here? What did I do wrong? What did my kids do wrong? I mean, you, all kinds of questions just come up. But this is what Job said, Job thirteen fifteen, Though he slay me, that is, he's speaking to God. He says, look, I understand that God, you're in total control. Even though someone else slayed my children, even though the enemy may have given me the boils and, and whatever diseases I may have, yet you're still in control. And though you slay me, Lord, I will hope in him. I will hope in him. I still hope in you. I will still hope in you because you are in control. Because you're God. You sit upon the throne. And, and you know past, present, but you also know future. And you work things out for good somehow, some way. And we know in the life of Job, he worked it out for good. We know that. Three Hebrew boys, same type of situation. You know, they were going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And I love what they said. Look, if God wants to take us, then, then we're gone. Yeah, no problem. But if God wants to save us, then so be it. Whatever the Lord's will is, in a sense. And of course, the Lord decided that he would save them. And so it was all faith and trust in the God that they served. In the God that they served. Not in prayer. Sometimes we think, well, if I pray, then my prayer will be answered because I'm praying. No, not necessarily. Who are you praying to? Who are you praying to? That's important, not just that you're sending vibes out there, you know, but you're praying to someone. Some people think that buildings can save you, that, 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 that somehow God is in buildings, and if you go to a building or a church and, and the atmosphere is just right, and the candles are lit, and it's you know, really dim and so forth, ooh, God's there, you know, and the building will save me. No, the building can't save you. Once you leave the building, that's it, you're done. I can't save you. Something, oh, the pastor, he's got all the answers. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't have all the answers. I can't be there with you all the time. I got a call on New Year's Day. Uh, this 86-year-old man called me up, and <clears throat> I missed his call, so I called him back. I get all calls here, so I, I try not to miss them, and I return them if I, if I do miss them. So I called him back, and, and we, we talked for quite a bit. He just got out of the hospital, and he has no family. He's 86 years old. He's ready to die. In fact, he, he said, I want to go. But for some reason, God still has me here. And um, he was losing, losing hope. And he just wanted someone to talk to. He goes, and I appreciate you calling me back because I called 200 churches and no one's called me but you. you know, so I appreciate but I understand it's New Year's and they're probably off with their family doing things. And I says, not me. I'm just sitting here. <laughs> And so we had a, a neat conversation, and he said, I would appreciate it if you put me on your calendar and call me every so often. Not, not like two years from now. You know. And I said, I'm going to surprise you. I'm going to call him this Monday. But I'm going to surprise you. I'm going to call you again. And he said, well, maybe we can even sit down and talk. I said, well, let's talk on the phone first. Let, let's get to know each other, and then we'll see about visiting you and and creating a relationship <clears throat> with you. So he was hoping, and he's a believer in Christ, and he was seeking the Lord, and we connected, you know, and it was, it was nice, and it was wonderful. There was a connection there, but to hope in nothing doesn't make any sense to me. We have to hope in something. Uh, Moses didn't even hope in a staff. He hoped in God who said, put the staff in the water, and the waters will divide. His obedience was to put the staff in the water, but he didn't look at the staff and go, come on, staff, you can do it, staff. And if I just keep thinking positive and know you can do it, and if I have faith in my faith that my faith that my faith can do it, then it's going to be done. No, he said, God said it, so I'm doing it, and boom, it was divided. Because God said it, and God keeps his promises.
So Jesus is the object of our hope alone. That's it. In fact, that's why he said, when you pray, you know, pray in this manner. He says, our Father who art in heaven. And when you ask, ask in my name and I will give it to you. And so it's important that we ask in Jesus' name. And that's why we pray as believers in the name of Jesus Christ. Because it's by his name that we're asking. Not my name, not the church's name, and not just because it's a prayer, but because it's Jesus Christ. And that brings us to our next point. So we can overcome adversities understanding this. <clears throat> Miss Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy, who was 93 years old, said in a magazine address to her grandchildren. I was blessed when I read this because as a grandfather, I, I totally understand her. Sometimes you want to uh, shelter you know, your kids from what you went through you know, because you don't want them to go through it or even your grandkids, you want to shelter them. And, and so you have this tendency of, of kind of hovering them you know, and, and oftentimes God is saying you can't do that. And I realized that after a while when my kids started going through the things I went through and God was saying, I have to take them through that in order for them to see that I'm real. So I had to back off, you know. And that's hard to do because you want to be in control. You want to protect them. You want to, you know, take them by the head and move them every, every direction that you want. But God has to work in them. So I totally understand this. And she has a good perspective here. Though it's not one in Christ, but I understand the heart. She said, I hope they, her, her children, <clears throat> grandchildren, that they will have the strength to bear the inevitable difficulties and disappointments and griefs of life. Bear them with dignity and without self-pity, knowing that tragedies befall everyone and that although one may seem singled out for special sorrow, Worse things have happened many times to others in the world. And it is not tears, but determination that makes pain bearable. Now, is that true? It is determination, but it's also the Lord that makes pain bearable, knowing that he's right there with you. See, I love the cross because anything that I go through, I can always go to the cross and I can see the Lord going through it too. So if I have pain, I, I see he's had pain. If I have sorrows, he's had sorrows. If I've had sufferings, he's had sufferings. If I feel like I'm abandoned, nobody loves me, nobody cares about me, he was abandoned. It seemed like nobody loved him, nobody cared about him. So I totally relate to him on the cross. And that gives me the hope that he understands what I'm going through. We need to have that hope, though. We have to have hope. And it's natural, as the Greeks believed, uh, Henry Waldsworth said, hope is, or hope has many lives as a cat. And so it's just, it's got a lot of lives. And so we need to depend on a lot of hope. I kind of view hope as, as going around a corner of a big building. You know, you're hoping to see what God has for you and it's not there. So you're waiting to go around the next corner. And if it's not there, then you go around the next corner and you never can see what's around the corner, but you're hoping it's there. And then you go to the next corner, you know, and like Moses, 80 years later, you know, then you're delivering the people. But it may take time. You don't know what God has in mind. I hope that God helps us to overcome these adversities <clears throat> because adversities seem to be difficult and hard, but they're needed in order to build faith and patience in the Lord. Hebrews 6.13, Paul was talking about Abraham. He says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, now here's God's promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no other greater, he swore by himself. I love that scripture. You know, usually if I go, I swear by the Bible, it's the truth, you know. Or I, sp I swear by my mother's back. No, don't want to do that. You know, usually we swear on something like that. God says, I swear on, oh, there's no one higher than me, so... I swear on me. <laughs> you know? In other words, I'll keep my promise. You don't have to worry about it. He told Abraham, he said, saying, surely blessings I will bless you and multiplyings I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promises. How long did Mo uh, Abraham endure? At least we know 80 years. He lived to be 100 before Isaac came into the scene. So at least 80 maybe or somewhere around there. So he endured. 
God made him a promise and he waited patiently. Not really. <laughs> he still struggled, didn't he? He wasn't as patient. He took matters into his own hands and he laid with his, his, uh, servants, uh, his wife's servant's maid and then had a, a child which became a reflection of his flesh and caused some problems. But he did the best he could and he waited and God blessed him because of that. We need to wait patiently. Abraham believed God's promises and he was able to overcome those adversities. And then God granted those promises to him. Virginia and I, when we got married at the age of 18, we didn't have a lot. She came from a uh, middle class family. Uh, father owned a business. Um, very, they were well off. They weren't wealthy, but they were well off. I came from the lower part of the community. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the richer part <laughs> and, and didn't have much. My dad worked in, as a machinist somewhere at Norris Industries, uh, making shell cases, you know, that type of thing. So we got married at the age of 18, and I had to work. She had to work. We had to make ends meet. And I remember that uh, we were doing well enough that we thought about buying an a old new car to us. And we couldn't afford a new car. That didn't happen until 2001. But we got married in 79. So uh, we bought this old, but it was new to us. And it was a Grand Prix, 1982 Grand Prix. Had the nice little tan leather on the outside uh, top uh, <clears throat> there. Uh, tinted windows and really long. And it had a radio that we could actually listen to with a cassette player. You know, so to us, it was everything. You know, and she was able to drive it, and I drove the little escort, I think, to work back and forth. And we enjoyed it. And one day we were up here at 24 Hour Fitness on Limonite, and we came out to our vehicle, and it was gone. <laughs> Where did I park it? <laughs> it was nowhere to be found. Someone had stolen it. And so, knowing the system, you know, we called the police and we pleaded with them, please, as soon as you find it, just let us know. We'll go right over and pick it up because we know that they impound it and they wait for days and days and weeks and weeks and weeks. And then the impounding says, oh, you owe us this much money for holding on to your vehicle. And we knew that would happen. And we end up having to give the vehicle to them because we can't afford to pay. You know, I think at that point it was $1,400 to get our car on it. So they ripped us off twice. And so we ended up telling him to keep the vehicle because we don't have the money. You know? I was so mad. And, and we knew the Lord, but I was just really upset. I was like, Lord, I mean, this was your vehicle. You blessed us with it. We used it for your glory. You know, we, we tried to do the best we could. And then he reminded me, yeah, it was my vehicle. So if I gave it to you, I can also take it away from you. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're right. So I said, it's yours. Take it. So we got along. Without it for not too long, maybe six months, and the Lord blessed us with a, a van, an old new van. <laughs> and we needed it because the boys were getting bigger, they had friends, and we needed more room. And the Lord knows, He works all things out for good if we wait upon Him. We overcome these adversities. You know, yeah, the feelings, the emotions, the frustrations that all come along with it, those are the battles that we have to have. And then ultimately we say, Lord, you're in control. I totally depend upon you. See, we need to pursue truth. We need to see it objectively. And so the next point, pursue truth. In the Bible, hope is not normally expressed as desire. It's not something good that one would like to see happen all the time. Though it's nice to see good things happen. It's wish wishful thinking. But normally in the scriptures, it's expressed as expectation. Something good that one knows is going to happen and so anticipates it to happen. Now catch that. You should write this down as far as your hope. That it's not something you're wishing to happen but you're expecting God to make it happen. I'm not talking positive confession. I'm not talking about the wealth, health, health doctrine or anything like that. You're just expecting God to keep his promises to you. And he will because you're taking a step of faith. When you know the heart of God, that he is a loving father and he cares about you, then you can expect him to do wonderful things for you. I've seen it over and over and over again. 
this church building was going to be taken away from us after 13 years of being here, going through the house crunch, collapse, that whole thing. The owner lost it, and it became another person's property, then another person back and forth, and they told us to leave, and we had nowhere to go. We were thinking of going to trough school for a while, but we understood that would be a headache, setting up every Sunday, not having a Wednesday night anymore. So really, we started hoping in God, because we couldn't hope in ourselves. We didn't have the answers. We couldn't think of anything. And so we just said, Lord, you're in control, and so we're just going to depend upon you. So he sends this owner to our church on a Sunday morning to put a for sale sign out there. And as he was talking to everybody, you know, getting to know people, just introducing himself and so forth. Yeah, I'm the guy that's kicking you out. You know, yeah, this is my building. You owe me. You know, he didn't really do that. Well, he came in and sat down during the message, and I happened to be uh, teaching out of the scriptures where how hard it is for a man to enter the kingdom, of, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And he sat there listening to me, and he was so convicted. The guy drove up in a Mercedes, by the way. And so he was so convicted. Afterwards, he, he was just like, did, did, did you share that, that topic just for me? <laughs> I'm like, no. We go through the Bible here, you know, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, so we don't just pick out topics. Well, it sure s seemed like it was for me. <laughs> he goes, do you think I'm going to go to heaven? I'm like, are you rich? He goes, well, yeah, filthy rich. I'm like, well, I don't know. And so I shared with him the gospel. <laughs> Tuesday, he calls me, because that was a Sunday. He calls me Tuesday, and he said, hey, I'm thinking... You know, I met all the people there, and they were wonderful people. You've been in the community for 13 years or so. You guys really need to be in that church. I need to help you get that church. And so what can you afford? Because he, he owned the church at that moment in time. And so he, after it was all said and done, he's like, so do you think I'm going to get to heaven? <laughs> and so I had to share with him a little bit more. But see, it's those things that you see as you, you go through the adversities and you overcome all the worries and the cares and, and, and maybe God's, I mean, we have, maybe God's done with us. It's over. You know, I'm going to go back to working or whatever, you know, and there will be no more church here. And all of a sudden he comes in and does something great like that. That's the God we serve. And so he wrote in Jeremiah 29, 11, and we know this, and it's for us. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. But get that out of your mind. If you think God has evil thoughts of you. Well, wait a minute. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said about God. You don't know what the things that I've been through. I mean, uh, God's going to send lightning and strike me. No, God has no evil thoughts towards you. None at all. His thoughts are of peace for you. Get that in your mind. The enemy has evil thoughts of you. Your neighbor might have evil thoughts of you. Church members might even have evil thoughts of you. God has no evil thoughts of you. None whatsoever. Just of peace. He wants peace for your life. He wants rest. He wants to bless you. He goes on and says to give you a future and a hope. That's the heart of God. So understanding this truth that God doesn't have evil thoughts towards you and that he wants to give you that peace and he wants to give you hope for the future. For 2015, he wants to bless your life. So expect it this year. Expect him to do a great work in your life. <clears throat> so in a religious sense, as we said, hope is the expectation of a favorable future, but it's under God's direction. Under God's direction. Hebrew said, faith is a substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Not seen. You might not see it yet, but you're hoping, expecting it. Paul uses a great example of this. The plowman is worthy or, or should hope in his plowing. 1 Corinthians 9.10 When a person plants a crop, he takes seed... 
and he throws it in the soil that he has prepared. He doesn't see the crop, but he's hoping for a crop. He's expecting a crop to appear within so many days. And when the crop appears, he gets to reap what he has sown. That's expecting the Lord to do a work in our lives. So just like the crop that was sowed and was expected to grow, so we can sow our hopes in the Lord and expect God to bless us this year tremendously. And this truth that we need to believe in is found in scriptures. That's why it's so important to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, to study it and to understand what his promises are for you so that you have something to expect from the Lord. That brings us to our last point point endure trials patiently that's a tough one isn't it because we don't like trials whatsoever i've been waiting for six years for the lord to heal my hip i was up in my rafters in my garage and i was putting some things away and i was hanging on to a piece of two by four wood and it broke loose and i fell on my side I let out a scream that the whole neighborhood uh, would have heard. In fact, Virginia, and I believe it was Roman, were inside the house and they heard me scream. And it, it felt like forever. I, I could literally feel myself falling and just screaming at the top of my lungs and then boom, and then laying there. And they came running out, what happened? I'm like, don't touch me, don't touch me. And I was in pain. Turned out that I had tore some tendons in my hip. They didn't know it at the time. They took x-rays, bruised my, my ribs, but they didn't uh, do an MRI, so they didn't know about the torn tendons. And so I went about my healing process eight months later, and I felt better, and I went to do something, tear again. Another eight months, tear again. Finally got an MRI. You've got some small tears in there. You, know, you need to let them heal. I thought I could do it myself without PT, uh, physical therapy, so I um, tried to do it myself. didn't work out. Well, as soon as I felt better, I wanted to do too much. So I ended up going to physical therapy. So that tendon turned into atrophy. It, it just my muscles started to wither away because I couldn't walk. I couldn't use them like I did before. Then an atrophy turned into inflammation. I got bursitis, which is a swelling of the joints. There's pockets in there. And, and in order to get rid of bursitis, you literally need to spend a lot of time doing nothing and, and just letting it heal. It may take one to two years. They wanted to give me injections. And the day that I went in for the injections, I said, well, I'm feeling a little bit better. Okay, let's not do the injection. Well, it took me a year later. started feeling better. But it went from the bursitis to a sensitivity to, to artificial sweeteners. And I just realized that the artificial sweeteners have been affecting me. In fact, even my protein drinks and my protein candy bars all have artificial sweeteners. And so I didn't realize, and I was eating those and not putting, you know, the NutraSweet and the pink and the yellows and so forth. I stopped all that, but I didn't realize that stuff had it. So I cut all of that out, and I'm like, wow, what a difference. It's like I feel like a totally different person just cutting that out. So now I can feel my body uh, reacting normally to my physical therapy. So when I go work out, I'm not in pain for a long period of time. It's almost a quicker recovery. So I'm getting better. And it's been a long six years. And, and to tell you the truth, I haven't always been patient. There was times I'm screaming at God, why are you doing this to me? You know, why don't you just take me home? If you're done with me, don't, don't cripple me and, and put me in pain. Just take me home. I'm willing to go. You know, I wasn't the most patient person. And Virginia, well, are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Leave me alone. <laughs> you know, I'm in pain. What do you think? I'm okay. And I had to learn. I had to learn to be patient under trials. And it's a hard thing to do. Um, hard thing to do. It takes practice. And I think that's why God allowed me six years. Now, I can say this, that God has taught me a lot of things through it. Dependence on Him, trust and faith, know that He's working something out. Uh, At that time when I did get injured, before that, I was pretty much doing everything in the church. I'm just that kind of person. I'll do everything. And so no one was really doing much. And so when that happened... 
people had to step up to the plate and start doing things. And that was a good thing because then that caused growth in the church because people felt like, oh, I'm a part of this church. They need me there. I need to do something. And so they were now doing things. And that was another thing, relying on them now to do these things. Wasn't as perfect, but they were getting done. I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) And so the Lord taught me a lot, but it takes patience through these trials. The one thing that did help me was knowing that the Lord was with me the whole time and that around the corner there could be healing. It really could because every eight months I felt better and I thought, okay, is it now, Lord? And even with this thing, I'm thinking, okay, is it now, Lord? Because I hope it is. I really hope that it is. So you can endure these trials calmly and patiently in hope that God will get you through them because he promised that he will. Listen to what the psalmist said in 42.11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my conscience and my God. Hope in God. The only way we'll get through it is hope in God. If we have no hope, if we have no purpose and no plan, we will cuddle up in a little ball and die. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl said this, he observed the loss of hope and courage can have deadly effects on a man. As a result of my own experiences in a Nazi concentration camp, Frankl contended that when a person no longer possesses the reason for living, no future to look forward to, He shrivels up and dies. Any attempt to restore a man's inner strength in camp, he wrote, had first to succeed in showing him some future goal. Some future goal. We have to have a purpose for our lives so that it gives us hope to live. And in a sense, life is a concentration camp, right? In a sense, all of us one day will die. We'll all come to the end. And we can all have something, though, to look forward to in the Lord because he has good things for us, a future and a hope not to shrivel up and die. Let me close. Remember, we know that God always does what he promises, always, always. And it's because of his son, Jesus Christ, who we have hope in to glorify him. It's not wishful thinking. But it's a firm assurance about things that are unseen and still yet future. And so we can have hope. Hang on to his promises. Overcome those adversities. Pursue truth. Endure trials patiently. And God will do great works for 2015.